What's going on everyone? It's your boy, the Andy McNabb of Hooking Off the Jab, Jack Slack, and this is the Fights Gone By podcast episode 47, coming at you on the 25th of July, and it's a moderately sunny day here in the UK, I'm sipping from a relatively cold cup of tea, and we've got a big, big show coming up, and then we've got a rising show coming up, and we've got a little bit of news, uh, and my job's changed, so we've got tons of stuff to talk about. But let's do the news first, as is tradition. Top of the bill, uh, Dave Meltzer, the big tuna, uh, puts his estimate on Bellator New York City at 95,000 pay-per-view buys, which would be pretty poor given that Coker reckoned he could get about 200,000. It's really got to hurt them when you consider that Fedor's asking price is like 2 million per, per performance, uh, and he could probably still get that in Russia. Add to that that this was everything that Bellator could do on one card, um, and it, it's really starting to hurt them. Meltzer also put forward an estimate for UFC 213 at 130,000 buys, which is awful. That's like Demetrius Johnson headlining. Um, Maybe some of that is to do with Nunes versus Shevchenko falling through, which I did uh, last week. I was like, oh, can't imagine. Maybe it was the week before. I thought, can't imagine too many people being too upset about that. But maybe they were. Um, The strange thing is that Yoel Romero versus Bobby Whittaker is, to anyone who knows the sport, uh... Well, was one of the best matchups that you could make in any division. Um, so it's very sad that they couldn't move that at all. Really indicative of the problem with the UFC at the moment. They have one star and they don't seem to be able to make another. They put all their eggs in the Conor McGregor basket. Uh, well, no, they put some of them in the Ronda Rousey basket, but that one uh, was smashed fairly uh, decisively. But yeah, MMA, still a bit of a mess. What else is new? Uh, Jimmy Smith and Goldie were announced for the booth on Bellator 182. Uh, if you care about that, I mean, I don't really personally care if Goldberg's covering stuff or not. Uh, Jimmy Smith's always good. UFC 215 was announced to be headlined by DJ versus Borg and Nunes versus Shevchenko too. So I think maybe they're probably going to still try and book that on like the spite angle, you know, get people to buy it just to prove Dana White wrong, even though Dana White will make money off that. Um, but that is a terrible headliner and co-headliner for something that you actually want to sell to people. Uh, great event for um, TV, but not really a pay-per-view card. Um, what else we got? Oh, and Daily versus Larkin is, is in the works at Bellator, which is a really good fight. But uh, immediately when rumors started swirling, people were like, where's MVP? And you're like, just don't get your hopes up. That fight's never, ever happening. Uh Michael Venom Page is going to fight no one for as long as possible. Anyway, there's my usual MVP rant out of the way. Right, let's talk about um, the biggest piece of news personally affecting me this week. Uh, Vice Sports has, to all intents and purposes, closed, but really what it's done is essentially what Fox Sports did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they're moving towards entirely video content. Um, don't know how that's going to work out strange thing that these guys are doing because it's very hard to monetize video content unless you get a sponsor in the video um a lot of guys used to rely on their you know a lot of uh companies used to rely on their youtube channel um but obviously the adpocalypse basically ruined that so it'll be interesting to see how that works out i can see them probably walking it back in uh, a year or so and realizing oh wait people do like written content because you can't watch videos while you're at work but you can read articles um but anyway uh, Fightland was under the Vice Sports banner. Uh, I'd suspected this was coming when Fightland's site basically stopped being updated and we moved under the Vice Sports banner. Allegedly because there was a botched redesign of the Fightland site, but you know, at that point I was already thinking, okay, probably need to start looking for what I'm doing next. Um, but I mean, <sighs> lots of people sending me uh, well wishes and things like that. Do don't worry about me. I mean. Uh, I wasn't a vice employee. There aren't a lot of vice employees. If you don't really know how that works, uh, they've only got a few guys who are actually employed. Uh, Private Eye does pieces about that all the time. But most of their stuff is freelance. I have always been freelance. Um, I had a, an agreement in place very loosely with them where they take a certain number of pieces a week, which I very rarely actually got out. And I've never really looked around for anyone else because they were paying me well and letting me write what I wanted. Um, that to me is the sad part about this, not the, not the not paying me well for. Um, the, the fact that Fightland as a, a website, I really believed in that. I, you know, I, when I got to Fightland, I really thought this was a place where I could 
put my imprint on on the site and put my vision on it um and it really was like what i wanted it was somewhere where they covered not only combat sports extensively and you know almost exclusively but somewhere where uh martial arts journalism was done at a very high level and budget you know most martial arts writing is in things like black belt magazine which is essentially just a booklet full of adverts and uh, and a couple of articles in between um so it was pretty amazing to be on uh, a website with that much traffic and that much funding that was devoted to this uh, fairly niche activity. And I mean, as soon as this happened, there was a lot of, uh, oh, God, vice, blah, left wing, blah, liberal agenda, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of stuff on the vice main site that is just dreck. Um, one that I saw a few months ago was uh, 20 facts you didn't know about eating ass. <laughs> which was illustrated. I was like, why did I click this? Um, but, uh, you know, that's what gets hits. Um, Fightland were always incredibly good about letting me do whatever I wanted, uh, encouraged me to, in fact, and uh, gave tons of good writers uh, and great writers. Uh, a very, I should make the distinction. But they gave a ton of great writers uh, really good exposure and uh, and the chance to write what they wanted. You know, you had guys like Sasha uh, Mats Matsuzak, is it Matsuzak or Matuzak? Uh, I just call him Sasha. But Sasha was writing about uh, Chinese martial arts and history. You know, writing things about General, what was his name? General Chi, one of the very first guys to write a martial arts manual. Um, you had Lindsay Newell covering tons of Muay Thai stuff. Uh, you had L.A. Jennings doing a few articles there who went on to write the um, uh, book She's a Knockout, which is about uh, women in combat sports history, which I used for my... Uh, very first Patreon episode. There was a bit about, uh, what's her name? Mrs. Wilkes? I can't remember her name now. It's been that long. But uh, yeah, very talented writer. Uh, you've got Sarah, who, who wrote tons of hilarious pieces. Um, you've got Peter Carroll, who's obviously a big deal in the Irish MMA media. Um, and I, you know, I, I won't keep going on name checking people because I'll forget some of them and then I'll offend people. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you've been excluded from that list, it's not because I don't appreciate you. It's because I was just listing names that I could, I've got a ton of bookmarked um, articles on Fightland. And that's the other thing about Fightland. There was stuff there that I wanted to go back and read when I wasn't actually working, you know, and, and that's not not tremendously common for me. You know, I'll listen to the Heavy Hands podcast or a couple of other guys uh, when I've got downtime. But most of the time, I don't really follow other people's work. Um, Fightland had tons of stuff that kept me interested. Lots of misconceptions about Fightland. Um, the one that people always throw in my face is the Deadspin article from 2012 about how uh, Fightland was funded by the UFC. Uh, firstly, Deadspin owned by Gorka, steady on. Uh, but also, by the time I got there, which I think was 2014, can't remember. Um, yeah, the uh, I was asking them to let me use GIFs and the UFC wouldn't, so I just used them anyway. And they, <laughs> I used to get calls from my publisher and editor being like, they're really angry about this, but it's doing really well, so just keep doing this. Um, yeah, that was an uphill struggle getting the GIFs to start with. And then uh, around about the time of the WME IMG buyout, uh, I asked, is this going to be a problem for me at any point? <laughs> and I was told, oh, they've not been involved for years. So uh, the whole UFC ownership thing was quite short-lived and uh, ma mainly before I got there. Um, uh, but you still find these cretins being like, oh, they never cover Bellator. And I'm like, well, I do cover Bellator. I cover all their good events. I just don't cover their shit ones. And there, you know, there's a lot more shit events in Bellator than there are in the UFC. But to be fair, I did cover some shit events for the UFC because it was the only thing going on that week. The other common misconception is that I'm somehow involved, or I was somehow involved in running the site. Nope, not at all. Had had nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, I'm essentially part time. I write two, three articles a week, and I fuck off and can't be found in between. Uh, but I, every week, I'd open my inbox, and there'd be a ton of uh, letters from people trying to advertise on Fightland, people trying to get their articles on Fightland. Uh, it's just really strange that people thought that I was uh, somehow involved in that. But um, I think I'll just focus a little bit on the things I loved about working there. Firstly, they let me do whatever I want, which meant that while I did write tons of pieces about, um, you know, uh, the current fight going on, um, I also got to write things like my Wushu Watch column, which I would never have been able to do at like Bleacher Report or somewhere like that that was focused on exclusively uh, the MMA content. Uh, Wushu Watch, if you don't know, is my series about 
uh, charlatans in the martial arts, basically. Pressure point stuff, Sistema, you know, everything's in there. Knife defense, combatives, and even stuff like uh, Russian multiple man MMA, assault course MMA, all that silly bollocks. X-Arm, <laughs> which is the proof that um, Art Davy is a great example of a broken clock being right at least twice a day. Because uh, he uh, had the idea for the UFC and then had the idea for Exxon. So, yeah, not consistent, really. It also meant that I could write about movies and things like that. I wrote some stuff about Ong Bak, um, wrote comedy articles. I mean, I never got to write comedy at Bleach Report. In fact, to be fair, um, my editor encouraged me to write comedy articles. Uh, they, they said, look, we got this uh, footage of these kangaroos having a street fight in Australia. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. If you, I mean, if you haven't seen it, go look up the article Street Fighting Ruse uh, by Jack Slack. Because um, uh, they, they said we want this article written. And I was very uh, stiff up a lip and po-faced about it. I was like, will not lower myself to writing these comedy articles. And uh, really helped me loosen up. Because, you know, if you listen to the podcast, I do love taking the piss and having a laugh about things. Because this is a very silly sport we're in. Um, Everyone you admire is going to be a vegetable within 20 years in this sport. Uh, so you have to have kind of like a black sense of humor. But Michael, especially my editor at Fightland, really helped me open up and uh, start using humor more in my writing and ultimately move on to this podcast and start doing humor here. Um, I got to write things about koalas and all sorts of stupid shit. Um, Captain Kirk, I wrote a whole thing on Star, uh, the fighting style of Captain Kirk in Star Trek with a double hammer fist. What is it called? An axe handle. That's the one. So that was really fun, and it was just a, a great place to work. So uh, I might, might have lured you in with the title of this podcast being like, you're about to get the dirt on Fightland, uh, but no, I've got no hard feelings towards anyone at Vice, um, and I had an amazing time working there, and I'd, I'd especially like to thank um, Josh for bringing me on, uh, Michael for being my editor for the longest time, and uh, Trevor for being the publisher of Fightland, the guys that I dealt with most, to be honest, uh, and... Uh, onwards and upwards to new things. I mean, in terms of what I'm doing next, like I said, I've always been freelance. I just never looked around because Fightland were, were treating me so well. Um, got some offers in the inbox, obviously, but I won't discuss them on air. Uh, really, for me, the big things are that I do this part time. Um, so I don't really want to be having to write every day. Um, I want to enjoy myself. So I want to be able to write something you know, like two articles. Sometimes I spend like two weeks on an idea. Sometimes I spend a day on an idea and bash it out. You know, it just depends on what time I've got and how I'm feeling. Um, so I tend to like places where I can do like two articles a week um, or three, you know, at a push. Um, but I also, I, it's always been a big deal to me that my work doesn't get buried. And that was one of the things that I really liked about Fightland. If you work somewhere like, well, I found this at Bleach Report. Um, you know, I was getting tons of support from the editorial guys for the stuff I was writing, but it would get buried underneath a hundred other articles written by guys each day. Um, and, you know, when you put as much time and thought into something as uh, I tend to do with my articles, it really bugs you when, like, the next piece of Twitter drama uh, it just immediately stacks in above your article and then there's five others before the hour's over and then suddenly your your huge article has uh, been buried underneath all that. So that's always been a priority for me. So I don't know where I'll, I'll go. I mean, I've been doing stuff for Fighters Only, the magazine. Um, I've been doing uh, this podcast, obviously. I mean, the success of the podcast as a independent um, venture uh, makes me really want to... For a long time, I've wanted to do... Basically, what uh, Richard K. Fox, who I'm always mentioning in the history episodes, did back in the 1800s. I want to do my own publication and I want to focus on sports and maybe crime because those are the things that interest me. Um, but it's, it's such a time consuming activity. You know, it's making me think about what I want to do with my my uh, my actual job and my, and my real life. Um, I've always talked about if I retire, or rather when I retire, I'd like to do some uh, scouting stuff or uh, even be involved in matchmaking or something like that for a, a major promotion. Or, um, But, you know, I, <laughs> it's all up in the air. Uh, I've got a big 
thing in the works at the moment, which is really just a vanity project. I mean, I'm probably not going to get paid for it by anyone, but uh, it's going to be an independent thing, and I just want to do it for the sake of doing it. But I'll tease that nearer the time. Uh, it's going to take a while. Oh, and the book's going well, so I could always just write another book. Uh, <laughs> I'll plug that later, so we'll get on to that then. But at any rate, thank you to Vice, thank you to Fightland, thank you Vice Sports. Uh, I'm sorry that you now believe that videos are the future, especially after you wouldn't fund Ringcraft 4, but, um, you know, I had the best time working there and the Fightland guys were awesome. Right, uh, the fights this weekend, I did watch some of them, but understandably I was a bit miffed with the fight world this weekend, so I sort of, like, dipped in and out. Uh, Gastelum versus Weidman was a really good fight. Uh, great to see Chris Weidman get back on the winning, winning track. Uh, my favourite fight of the night was probably Rivera versus uh, Almeida. Thomas Almeida is like a badger in a sack on offence uh, and a fish in a barrel on defence. Like He's just the most accurate, vicious guy when he's working, but also the most hittable guy in the world. <laughs> it's just absolutely bizarre. Um, so he's coming in, he's, and he's got this peekaboo guard, which, firstly, if you haven't got boxing gloves there, having your fist in front of your chin isn't going to stop any punches. Um, and then he doesn't move his head. He only really moves his head when he's using the inside slip because he loves landing that right hand or the right elbow. Um, but he doesn't move it, like, generally when he's walking forward. So he's a mark for the right straight, and Rivera was putting the right straight on him and coming in with the left hook afterwards, you know, pushing him back into that left hook. Um, hurt him a couple of times with that. I'll be honest, I've not seen as much of Jimmy Rivera as I should have. You know, he's been one of those fighters who's been bobbing along in the background, uh, and I have seen him fight before, but I just haven't really picked up on his habits and stuff. But he really uh, impressed me in this fight, and I was watching this thinking, I've watched this guy before, why was I not super into him then? Um, so yeah, that was a fun fight, but I think today we'll focus on what's going on at USC 214, because... That is the fucking bomb. Um, we got the return of the king, John Jones, which should be a massive deal. He's fighting uh, Daniel Cormier. At the time of this recording, nothing has fallen through yet. I think they've been booked five times against each other, um, if you include the first one. So I think they've been booked like four times against each other for the rematch. But John Jones managed to stay clean and out of trouble long enough. Daniel Cormier has not been injured, so we're all good. Hopefully. Now, I wrote um, a tactical guide to John Jones versus Daniel Cormier 2 at Fightland with art by uh, Jan. So, oh, I forgot to thank Jan. But um, if, you, if you want to go check that out, that's basically, you know, not an awful lot has changed since then because um, the uh, focus of that piece was on the first match and what uh, each man would need to keep or do differently. BJJ Scout also put out a thing this week. I've not watched it yet, but uh, apparently that's all about the clinch stuff. Basically... Daniel Cormier loves to get that single collar tie and use uppercuts, um, but by the by the midpoint of the fight, John Jones uh, was just going two hands on that uppercutting hand, you know, wrist control. John Jones used his wrist control really well. He was doing the same thing against Glover Teixeira. In fact, the Teixeira fight and the Cormier fight had a lot in common. He'd just shut down the right hand at any opportunity, um, and then he, he'd move uh, Cormier to the fence, and he, he hit some doubles off that. Uh, obviously elbows very well off that position. If you've got the guy's hand pinned to his waist, uh, you know, his, his chin is going to be a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, certainly his temples. Did some decent body work in that fight um, against the cage, but not like the levels that he was using against Tessiera. Um But for me, the main point that I put forward in the tactical guide was that walking through John Jones's like jamming kicks and body kicks and things is not an answer to them uh if you watch the guy who did best against john jones um alexander gustafson a lot of that is because he's moving laterally all the time and john jones can't straight kick him uh because every time john jones straight kicks gustafson's already circling around um and then there's a nice parry at one point where he steps in on john jones when he's crossed his legs and, and that's the first takedown of john jones's career but John Jones has been a really interesting guy to watch develop because, well, firstly, you know, we're not talking about the human element here uh, because his development as a person has not been tremendous. Um, but as a fighter, certainly, he's been fascinating because he came in with all this talent uh, and he's throwing spinning back shit everywhere. And I was thinking, oh, this guy could get in trouble when he starts meeting slicker strikers or more experienced guys who aren't just going to uh, freak out when he starts doing this. You know, the kind of wrestlers that he won't be able to just ragdoll like he did... Uh, 
Stefan Bonner and, and people like that. But he got the title shot against Shogun. A lot of that was the wrestling. You know, he could just ragdoll Shogun. Because Shogun, great offensive trips and stuff from the clinch. Terrible uh, takedown defense, generally. Um, and that was one of those fights where that if you want to show someone a poster for the dangers of trying to drag yourself underneath an opponent or drag them on top of you for deep half guard without doing something clever to set it up first. That's one of the best ones. I mean, I always talk about Bigfoot Silver versus Kane or Jose Aldo versus um, Noguera, but Shogun versus Jones is a great example because Shogun was one of the first guys to really utilize deep half guard well in MMA. Um, but he just tries to dive underneath Jones and Jones sticks his arms out and posts on them and uh, Shogun gives himself a hernia trying to pull Jones through the bones of his arm uh, and then Jones starts dropping elbows on him. You know, It's a very nasty position to end up in because if the guy is on base and you can't actually get under him, you know, all you've got is your arms under him and then they're trapped. But that was a great fight. Jones worked him up and down. Uh, Fly needed him in the opening seconds. Rock bottomed him. Uh, and then dropped him with a body shot and a knee to the face for the finish, uh, which was really nice. But tons of brutal ground and pound. But then when he was booked against Rampage and uh, Rashad, and you know, as we're getting into guys who maybe shouldn't be so easy for him to ragdoll, um, you're seeing him develop this uh, distance striking game, which is a lot slicker. You know, there's no, well, there's still some spin stuff, but generally his spin stuff is more cautiously put together. He'll, he pioneered that like, along the fence, pressing into their chest and then working your arm across, almost arm dragging yourself so that you're ready to spin for the elbow, uh, which you see almost everyone doing now at some point in their career. Um, but the straight kicking is a, has been a, a, become a huge thing. I mean, he pioneered the low line straight kicks, which everyone hates largely because of him. Um, and I remember thinking before the Rampage fight, OK, he's just going to pick him apart on the way towards him. Uh, and that was really the fight where you saw him step up the use of those straight kicks. Uh, janked up Jackson's knee pretty badly. Um, but Quinton didn't have any answers for it because Quinton never checks low kicks. And, you know, if, you, if you're not going to check round low kicks, well, you know, you're not going to be able to start picking your leg up for straight low kicks and, uh, and getting in off them as easily. Uh, those jamming kicks work wonderfully against guys who just want to walk into the pocket. Uh, same thing against Vitor Belfort. And while it was less straight kicks and more uh, body kicks, like snap kicks and round kicks, um, against Daniel Cormier, uh, he also used a long left straight, he went to Southpaw and used a long left straight to the midsection. Uh, he was just pounding Cormier's body as he came in. And that was a large part of why you saw Cormier tire. Um, you know, a huge amount of that fight was done in the clinch. There was tons of clever stuff going on. Every time uh, Cormier got close enough and Jones was in a uh, orthodox stance, Cormier likes to go for that lead leg for the uh, head outside single, uh, or the high crotch, whatever you want to call it, uh, and Jones would just step back into the southpaw stance, you know, with a with a forearm across uh, Cormier's face and uh, and take that angle away from him. But the stuff out in the open is a huge deal. I mean, D Daniel Cormier was doing decently in the clinches throughout. Uh, but he did get very tired towards the end. And if you're taking dozens of body shots every time you walk forward, that's going to be playing a, a big factor there. Um, I think in the tactical guide I talked about maybe using the cross check, which is a great one for guys who are dealing with kickers but want to get in and start hitting with their hands. Um, so rather than, uh, you know, a, a more traditional Nakamoy, if he's faced with, like, uh, if you're both left foot forward and you're faced with a left round kick, he might pick up his right leg to check it, where in MMA, more often you'll just see guys take it on the forearm. Um, picking up that left leg and bringing it across the body is a great way to basically create a barrier across the side of your body. And it doesn't just work against round kicks. That's the great thing about it. If you watch Bader Harry use it against Semi Shilt, which is my favorite fight for showing the effectiveness of the cross check, um, Semi Shilt's main thing is the triangle kick or the, or the front snap kick. You know, he digs in these kicks that are almost straight line kicks. Um, but that cross check knocks them offline, denies them the line that they're going to go through, uh, and Bader Harry is able to step in with the right hand immediately afterwards. If you want to close the distance, cross check, really good idea. But what makes this match so interesting is that John Jones looked really bad against Ovin Simpru, and I know that people will take issue with that because 
he did win and it was a shutout. You know, <laughs> there was no point there was no point where you were like, oh, Ovinson Prue's in this fight. But Ovinson Prue has never thrown a two punch combination in his life, or had never, until that fight. And then the two that he threw, you know, and they were basic one twos as well, uh, actually caught Jones. But Ovinson Prue turns up for the first round and typically gasses fairly early. Uh basically He's an explosive dude who kicks really hard, and that's all you really need to know about Ovinson Prue. Um, but he's tall and long, and that seemed to really freak Jones out. But it was a fairly short notice fight, so you know, um, not an awful lot you can gain from that, other than the fact that Jones came in in really bad condition. Um, you'd hope that he's uh, realised that and come in in better condition for this one. But then this is one of those stories where we're all waiting for this to go off the rails. If you are living the party lifestyle, as almost every fighter does. Uh, when they reach that level, it does eventually catch up with your work. I think everyone wants Jones to turn out to be the cautionary tale. At any rate, um, keys for this fight, John Jones, work at the distance, shut down the uppercut in the clinch, shut down the high, uh, high crotch. Same things as the last time, really. Um, but get on that uppercut earlier because he was getting uppercutted in the first and second. Um, and I, I would like to see him go low line kicks more, especially with the knowledge that uh, DC has a fairly injurable knee. For DC, uh, lateral movement on the outside and, you know, spiraling inwards rather than just coming in on the straight line. And if he is going to move straight in, uh, come in behind the lead knee, raise it up and, and fall down behind it. If it's off the floor, it's not going to get kicked straight. Uh, and if it's up in a, like a nice cross check position or even in front of you, it's going to jam kicks as they come at you. Toby Comey, as they call it in, uh, in karate. But that should be a really uh, interesting fight. That division, very messy at the moment, but um, God, how good would it be to set up the rubber match if Cormier wins this one and, uh, and Jones does the whole, I'm, I'm going to rehab and I'm going to uh, redevote myself to God and then, and then I'm going to come back and win. That'd be great. I'd love that. That whole angle. Oh, perfect for TV. In fact, perfect for pay-per-view. Um, it would be interesting to see how Jones does on pay-per-view, actually, because... He was, you know, he was one of their lesser pay-per-view stars in an era when they had pay-per-view stars like uh, Anderson Silva, GSP. Um, Ronda Rousey was around during uh, the latter end of Jones's uh, run as champion. Um, but, you know, where he was a lower end draw then, he will probably be one of their best draws now. So um, that'll be interesting. Right, we're going to do uh, some questions, and we're going to take a break, do some questions, and then we'll go back to the UFC 12, uh, sorry, uh, 21, four, uh, can't say numbers right today, 214, I'm reading them off a piece of paper. Uh, we'll go back to the UFC 214 rest of the card after some questions. Uh, but first, a quick plug, if you aren't a Patreon boy, do uh, consider joining up to the Patreon. It's where we do the history lecture each month for uh, Patreon boys, and... Uh, this month it's going to be Joe Lewis, uh, which is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. So I put it off a little bit last time because I was like, I don't want to, don't want to not do this justice. But uh, Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, uh, huge issue, both you know, one of the best technical boxers uh, and knockout artists of all time, uh, perhaps the greatest heavyweight of all time. We'll get into that argument because there is an argument to be made. Um, and also just a, it's an important issue in terms of race relations. It's an important issue in terms of what was going on in Europe at the time. Um, you know, there's Nazism in this story, which everyone loves. Uh, not Nazism, but having Nazism, Nazism in the story. And you've got all the usual money moving and trickery that goes on in uh, managing professional fighters. So if you're not a Patreon boy and you want in on that, go sign up to the Patreon. And if you are American... Fantastic news. My publisher stepped up the publication of Notorious in the US. You can now buy Notorious on Amazon.com. Uh, uh, you can probably buy it at whatever other booksellers there are in the US, but I don't know, Barnes & Noble, they still a thing. If you don't like Conor McGregor, it's not really a book just about Conor McGregor. It's a book about the Conor McGregor effect. It's a book about money and fighting. It's a book about fighting. Uh, it's a book about everything, really. I mean, I've done the rubber trade in Manaus. <laughs> I've done the... Uh, history of Irish fighting in Boston. Um, it goes all over the place. And uh, I mean, I've read an awful lot of books on fighting and I would say that it's my favourite. <laughs> um, so consider that. And if you've got a friend who uh, has never shown an interest in boxing or MMA before, but is now talking about how Floyd Mayweather needs to be worried about uh, Conor McGregor's MMA angles, give him the book as a treat. Go on. Right, I'm going to refresh my tea and then I'll be back to answer some questions. Cheers.
And I'm back! Tea turned into lunch, had a ham and cheese sarnie. It was lush. Right, today we're going to turn to the Facebook rapid fire thread for questions. Jeels asks, why do boxers' legs get shot? Um, yeah, this is a very famous comment, you know, anytime anyone talks about Ali, well, I mean, you could watch it happen in Ali, his legs were shot. Uh, it wasn't helped by Antonio Inoki kicking him in the knee, but um, his legs very clearly slowed down between his prime and his return from uh, exile. But I think rather than shot, uh, I think mostly what we're talking about is a loss of speed um, or agility. Uh, you know, a guy, it's not, it's probably not going to be as big a deal now because uh, athletes are taking better care of themselves and um, the drugs are so much better, let's be honest. Uh, if you saw Vladimir Klitschko turn up at 41 in the best shape of his life and moving better than he ever had, um, you know, we can keep guys healthy longer now. Um, however, you know, if... Well, in fairness to Vladimir Klitschko, a lot of his style isn't moving around that much. Um, if you are a guy who is constantly moving and stuff like that, a guy who relies on his footwork all the time, you know, um, that's going to be a lot more obvious when you start slowing down. And, of course, there's the endurance factor. Um, a really interesting example of a boxer who... Uh, maybe his legs weren't shot, but he certainly had very public struggles with them, was Manny Pacquiao. Uh, Manny Pacquiao, you know, in terms of footwork, he has some of the most disciplined and consistent footwork uh, you'll see on any boxer, and he uses his feet all the time. That's how he sets up his attacks and takes angles and leaves on angles. Um, his whole thing is, is moving and... Uh, there was an American football player that said uh, out of any sport he's ever seen, no one is in the right place at the right time as much as Manny Pacquiao. Um, but Pacquiao disappeared. I can't remember which fight it was, but he disappeared half an hour before it and they went all over the uh, casino trying to find him and they found him stretching off his calves because they were in spasm. Um, he moved so much that his uh, body started rebelling against him. And if you look at Ma Manny Pacquiao's calves, they are just like tennis balls. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, the whole thing about legs being shot is if you move like an athlete, you know, not, not like Bernard Hopkins, someone who's, or Vladimir Klitschko or someone like that, who's very measured in their footwork, very cautious, economical, Joe Lewis style maybe. Um, but if a guy does a lot of uh, bouncing in, bouncing out, bouncing is very hard on your legs to begin with, you know. Um, Watch any competitive karateka, the amount of bouncing they do. Uh, it's, your knees aren't built for it first, but also you're using your, your calves all the time. Your ankles are taking a pounding. Uh, it's why jumping rope is so bad for you. And running, to be honest, is fairly bad for you. It's much safer to do it on a nice cushy treadmill. Uh, and now they're talking all about how you've got to do it barefoot. Um, but, you know, there's all sorts of things that take it out of your legs. I w wouldn't say that there's a magic point when someone's legs are shot, but uh, boxing especially is one of those sports where you can cover for a lot of stuff with technique. And if you are very cautious with your technique throughout your career, you can rely on your physical attributes yet less. If it's a purely athletic contest, uh, you at 20 versus you at 35, it's going to be like you in a, in a sprint. You know, you're know, you going to see one guy slowing down clearly. And if you do a lot of bouncing and bouncing out stuff, um, that's going to be more obvious. That's going to have a more obvious effect, rather. That was a long answer to a quickfire question, sorry. Uh, Ian asks, how will the middleweight division look in one year? Michael Bisping will still be champion. He will have fought Karen Bryant uh, to a close decision, and uh, he still will not have fought Bobby Whittaker, who will have lost to someone else by that time. Ian also says, also will the UFC add more weight classes, like California suggests, uh, in order to be able to stack more pay-per-views? Uh, probably. This is their new thing. Put belts on it. Uh, doesn't really work, as we've seen. Interim title did nothing to sell uh, UFC 213. Nobody cared about Holly Holm versus Jermaine, Jermaine Geradamy. Um, even Anthony Pettis and Max Holloway, even though they're great fighters and that was a great fight, uh, nobody gave a shit about their title. Didn't didn't have the effect that they thought it would have. People care about a champion, and you, know, you can win a belt and still not be perceived as a champion. Uh, people care about guys who are there defending their belt all the time, uh, and excitingly. And that's, even that is not a complete list of what people care about, because people don't care about Demetrius Johnson, and he's been doing that for years. As a side note, I have considered uh, going to the UFC again about running their flyweight division now that I have this time on my hands. Marcel says, will Cain Velasquez ever regain the gold? Um, 
you never can count anyone out in heavyweight, but I think it's looking more and more like Cain Velasquez is going to be a guy who's going to be his own undoing through injuries. You know, he's fighting so little, and I don't know if the UFC will want the strap back on him when he can't make the defences. That being said, with the UFC hosting the silliest and biggest boxing match of the year, uh, you've got to think that they're still in love with the idea of the uh, Hispanic demographic. So you can never count it out. It's really what matches get made at heavyweight, because they, you know, he could be in the title fight tomorrow based on whatever he's done already. Um, so I wouldn't ever dare to count him out when it's so easy to get a, a, a title fight at heavyweight. Sonny says, how will Mayweather deal with the MMA angles? Get fucked, Sonny. Um, <laughs> Joe says, what are some fun pl uh, traps to play in the gym? What I like to do is uh, in the locker room, uh, just put a sheet of cling film over the toilet. Actually, unrelated story. I went to um, Marcelo Garcia's uh, a few years ago. Um, and at the time, I, I met and rolled with all these amazing guys. And I knew that they were amazing, but I had no idea who they actually were. So I rolled with Gianni Grippo. Didn't have any clue who he was uh, until afterwards. Um, but I also met, uh, what's his name? Bernardo Faria. Uh, and he is the nicest guy in the world for a start. But also, I knocked his stuff all over the dressing room by accident as soon as I got in there. Because if you've ever been to Marcelo's, uh, people put their stuff behind the door, which is, you know, it's a bit cramped in there. Uh, but I knocked his stuff all over the floor and he was super nice about it. He was so nice. And I just thought he was some big dude. And then we got out onto the mats and he was teaching. And then I found out immediately afterwards that he's, you know, several time world champion, beat Buschetcher, uh, just a legend. But absolutely lovely guy. And I am a klutz. Michael says, can you explain the difference between a cross in boxing and a reverse punch in karate? Whenever you show Chinza Machida catching people with right hands, you explain he's catching them with a reverse punch. But to me, it looks like it's just a cross thrown with incredible timing that a Machida has. <laughs> a Machida. Um, I know I'm obviously missing something, but could you explain the difference? Side note, notorious ships for me tomorrow and I'm excited. Yes, good. I use the term reverse punch because we were talking about karate at the time, but, um, I, you know, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive however the way that the straight is taught in karate is from the hip um and when you're doing it in competition you normally go from like the belly or the chest to get the point you can't come back to like a proper guard now throwing from where the hands are low does it seems to be uh, mainly a, a mental thing but it makes you link your hips to your punches more um so like guys like gene tunney would punch with their hands from their chest uh, you know, that it's not exclusive, you know, you can throw a right straight like that. So it's not, I don't really, when we're getting into the names and stuff, it's not that important. But the other thing about karate straights generally is that um, where, and this is also going to change from instructor to instructor, but generally um, where the right straight often in boxing is a punch thrown without moving the feet uh, and with a t twist at the hips, uh, the gyakazuki or the reverse punch is from that nice long stance, but you go from weight over the back leg to weight over the front leg. You are not just twisting your hips, you're moving them forward. It's that transition of weight. All Alternatively, you're stepping with your left foot as you move your hips forward and twist them. Really just a powerful way of throwing a right straight. Not tremendously important in terms of terminology. Because you can throw a right straight like that in boxing if you want, you know? <laughs> it's just that um, the weird way that it's taught in karate and the weird way that it's scored in competition karate lead to guys coming into MMA with this weird hands-by-the-chest sort of style of punching and they'll step in on the right hand rather than step in with the jab and then twist the hips and land the right hand. Uh, also in boxing, a lot of guys, uh, if you watch like Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, who we talk about a lot, um, they'll throw the jab to get in move their left foot with the jab and then bring their right foot up to throw the right hand. Uh, reverse punch in karate, typically you're always driving off the back leg when you're throwing the punch. But again, there's a thousand different ways to throw a right straight. There's a thousand different ways to teach a reverse punch. Essentially, they are the same technique. It's really getting into nitpicking when we're doing that, uh, when we're talking about differences between them. Tim says, why do you think Chris Cyborg Justino gets so much hatred for her PED use compared to other fighters such as Anderson Silva, brackets, he's the goat, etc. Or Krokop, brackets, his pride days, oh my god, etc. A friend of mine argued that women get far more long-term benefit from PED use, uh, brackets, lifelong, higher bone density, even after years of juicing, etc. I think he's blowing smoke. Love the show, keep slacking in the free world. Um, yeah, if you... It, everyone has these double standards you're gonna learn this like your hero one of your heroes i promise is using performance enhancing drugs um people don't like it because 
uh, Cyborg got caught and because, you know, her whole career she's been put up against much smaller women because there aren't any women her size to fight her. Um, add that to testing positive for steroids and people will just pretend that she is not just a big woman who took some steroids. She is a woman who is huge because she took steroids. And a lot of people just hate her because she talks so much smack and then very rarely actually fights. Um, but we'll get on to that later. Matt says, Jack, I just started a podcast of my for my own kind of company, uh, Dirty Clean Eats. Any tips starting out? Don't know. I'm still very new at this. Um, my tip would be be yourself uh, and invest in a better microphone. Uh, and whatever your microphone is, you can definitely get better. Like <laughs> That's what I'm learning. I've been through about three mics already. Joe asks, now that you are a free agent, any plans to write a martial arts fantasy novel around George Dillman? Yes. I would not feel comfortable without having that checked by a team of lawyers, but I would write a fan fiction, but then I could change the names and turn, turn it into like an erotic film for women. Um, anyway, Sonny says, will you ever become an MMA coach? Yeah, maybe one day. I'd like, I do like teaching. Um, I, I would like a gym of my own. Uh, add those two together and I suppose it would be easier for me to pay the rent on the gym if I were teaching there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, why not? Carl says, will training in boxing help me ton it punch tennis balls like Lomachenko? No, punching ten tennis balls will help you punch tennis balls. If you saw uh, Chris Weidman, he had like a... What are they called? Ah, oh, they used to have them at like um, children's play zones. The, the things that you smack the light on the wall uh, and the light moves around. Uh, they have them in arcades too. But there was Chris Weidman punching one of those uh, to work on his accuracy. And then someone... Uh, spliced that in with him missing every punch against Kelvin Gastelum when he was trying to finish him. Reese says, do you think there's a bias against pressure fighters? A lot of the time when people consider someone technical, they are talking about someone that fights at a distance, doesn't hit hard, and moves extraneously, and wasting energy regardless of if it is effective or not. A lot of aggressive fighters are called brawlers, while ignore while ignoring the craft it takes to safely approach an opponent and break them down, even if they are even if they throw more, more powerful punches. Especially when it comes to a term like footwork, what are other faux intellectual MMA opinions do you dislike? Uh, oh, God, actually, the footwork one really hacks me off. I wrote an article for Bleacher Report called, like, uh, sloppy footwork is not what you think it is, or something like that. And just compared the footwork of George Foreman, um, Joe Lewis, and Muhammad Ali. All three of them used their feet for exactly what they wanted to, but looked very different. People love the show, if you do an Ali shuffle, it is completely pointless. I've seen Muhammad Ali used it to land a punch once in his golden gloves days. But uh, if you do it, people will go, oh, fancy footwork, uh, or how slick is his footwork? Um, meanwhile, there are other guys who people consider very vanilla or plodding, and they've got much neater footwork that actually accomplishes something. I've got to say my main thing that pisses me off, which is really uh, prevalent in MMA, not so much in boxing, is showboating. People think that showboating itself is winning the fight. Uh, where, like, if you watch someone like Roy Jones showboating, it'll be because he's already winning the fight. Uh, whereas guys in MMA will try and showboat even though they're not winning the fight. Anderson Silva used to do it tons, you know. Like, people thought that Anderson Silva was winning the first round of the first Weidman fight based on the fact that he was doing the hands down stuff. It's like uh, scoring a guy around because you think he's not bothering to try, uh, even though. Weidman was jabbing him clean and uh, and Silva was getting nothing going. In fact, that photo that they released of Conor McGregor sparring with Paulie Mal Malignacci with his hands behind his back, you're like, well, firstly, that's a still image, so let's not get too deep into that, but you can put your hands behind your back and, and then achieve nothing with it or get hit in the head. Like, the act of putting your hands behind your back is not really anything. It's the, It's what you are able to do with it. Or if you were able to do it while the other guy's coming at you like a rabid buzzsaw. Another great one, Jazeus Calvin Cavalcante, Jay-Z, uh, fought Josh Thompson in Strike Force. Josh Thompson ends up on his back uh, in like half butterfly guard and starts pulling up the one leg for rubber guard, which is a very, you're not going to hit a lot of submissions from there or really anything um, unless you're very good or much, much better than the opponent and he's pretty bad. Uh, but he like makes a, a thumbs up at the camera and starts showboating and then he scored the round and you're like but he was on his back losing the fight um really strange bobby green was just uh, the worst to watch with that like every punch you hit him with he goes nope nope didn't hit me and everyone's going no you actually got hit and we all saw you get hit and you're not doing anything but i feel like if he threw more punches he'd win fights based on the perception of that showboating 
Omari says, I'm a Patreon boy. What are some sequences that you think give, that you see give some Thai boxers the most trouble? And when is Petrosian coming back? Petrosian will probably fight some scrub in Italy soon for Bellator kickboxing. Um, and in terms of troubling uh, Nakmoy or, you know, experienced Thai stylists, uh, I like the sidekick. I like back kicks. Uh, I like front snap kicks. Things like that. Uh, question mark kicks. Stuff that is not typically as common in uh, Muay Thai where the clinch is a lot more important and uh, and guys use push kicks and, and round kicks more. Um, I really liked, I can't remember who it was, the lad who fought Sainshai in his glory debut. I mean, he, he was pretty outclassed, but he came out in the first round doing stuff that would trouble Sainshai, you know, uh, side kicks and things like that. Being, he was longer than Sainshai for a start, but he was also doing stuff that Sainshai wouldn't see on the regular as much. You know, whenever you say that, people go, oh, but there are sidekicks in, bo- in uh, Muay Thai, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm talking about, like, what you generally see more of. Andrew says, could you please write or write something or talk about on the podcast, TJ Dillashaw versus Rafael Asenso? He either says one or I was watching the fight the other day, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I didn't write anything about the second one. Um, really interesting. Really liked in that fight, the great example of countering a low-line sidekick. Uh, Dillashaw notices... Uh, Sun Tzu doing it every time he steps in so then he fakes a step in reaches down and slaps the leg across and comes in with a left straight it was gorgeous um, really nice fights the pair of those actually uh, just kind of understated which is basically Rafael Sun Tzu's style he'll impress the uh, aficionado but he you know even the guys like me who love that stuff are very rarely excited during his fights um, like the Marlon Marias fight I was like oh this is all very good stuff it's just not really entertaining the crowd Daniel says, also a breakdown of Bobby Knuckles' anti-wrestling. Um, yeah, just that building up on the fence, bringing up the near knee uh, so that the uh, the outside hook is blocked by the fence, putting the elbow back through and then turning to face. Really slick moves. Been trying that a lot, actually, lately. Obviously not having nearly as much success as Bobby Knuckles, but it is interesting that even in, even Yoel Romero was completely lost with stuff to do from that position. Can't put the hooks in, so he tries to hook the near leg, doesn't really work out, and he just resorts to kneeing him in the ass, and Whitaker just stands up and turns into him. Philip says, on a flat earth, does Eddie Bravo win ADCC? Uh, if you've not seen Eddie Bravo's ADCC run, it was actually really interesting because he gives Hoyler Gracie a heap of problems and then submits him, uh, which was you know, jaw-dropping. No one saw that coming. Uh, but then in the next round, he meets Leo Vieira, and Leo Vieira beats him by one of the largest point margins I've ever seen. Leo Vieira just works all over him, lets him have back guard just to pass guard again, does rolling back takes on him. It's just standard Leo Vieira. Uh, and then I watched Leo Vieira versus Hoyler Gracie the other day, and Hoyler Gracie just stalled the shit out of it. It was bad. Uh, but that was in the gi. But Leo Vieira um, was really starting to uh, come into his own then. And, you know, Bravo gets a lot of attention because uh, he's such an interesting character and, you know, friends with Joe Rogan. Uh, and obviously being an American to submit a Gracie, incredible. But Leo Vieira um, around that time was doing incredible things. You know, he basically developed half the guard passing game that is used on the regular nowadays. And he was so young when he did it too. Philip also asks, can you understand why Bass has a hard-on for open, for the open square stance? I always felt like it would lead to easy takedowns. Bass wasn't known for his takedown defense. So this is only to be used in used sparingly, right? Uh, he also talks a lot about the target area not being much greater but it would invite loads of front kicks too. Am I off on this? Uh, square stances typically make you more open. They expose your center line. So straight left, straight rights, um, straight kicks generally, uh, you know, back kick or rather turning side kick. Um, and obviously if you aren't holding your hands well or you don't have big gloves on, it's easier to sneak around the side uh, with looping blows. But uh, there are several advantages. And of course, Bass Rutten really liked that left round kick. And he really liked it as a counter. Uh, There's a great one in Pancrase where he really squares up his stance and has that left leg ready to go. And as soon as the guy throws the right straight at him, he leans back and punts him in the in the uh, liver with the left leg. Um, yeah, ba- I mean, Bass's views are obviously unique to his own style, which was very unique to begin with. Uh, if you watch any of his pride commentary anytime there's a clinch he'll go he should roll for the knee bar right now and you're like oh dear but then that's coming back like you watch gary turn and he just literally gives up his back to to jump on knees or rather jump on uh, ashigarami and things like that or what's it called inside sankaku 411 they've all got ridiculous names honey hole um 
But yeah, guys are now doing that, baiting various clinches to try and grab the legs. So uh, he was a bit ahead of his time in that sense, but mainly the leg hunting in Pancrase was because uh, that that's a big thing in catch, and they also didn't really know very much about guard passing or the guard. Um, but then yeah, I, I know that Patrick Wyman uh, <laughs> loves to bring up Bass Root and say that the jab has no place in MMA or something like that. Yeah, there's all, all differing opinions on everything, and anytime you're talking in absolutes, uh, of course there's stuff that will prove you wrong, you know? Uh, which is why I was so cautious with that uh, reverse punch slash cross question back there. Malcolm says, flying kicks. Uh, I would point to the article I wrote last week called uh, Drop Kicks or something like that. It was about drop kicks. It was a wooshy watch. It was great. Joe says, have you considered getting guests on the pod? Yes, I have. I may well do that at some point. Again, all up in the air. Don't know what I'm doing next. Right, let's get back to business on the uh, UFC 214 preview. So the co-main event is... Uh, Tyron Woodley versus Damian Meyer. I feel like this fight should have happened already. Um, Damian Meyer has been running three guys for so long. Um, but if you didn't know this, the UFC doesn't like submission artists. Uh, him and Jack Array were just kept swimming in circles forever. Uh, and then Jack Array finally lost when they put him against Bobby Whittaker. Um, but he was having to fight guys like Tim Bowich. And you're like, why? Why is Jack Array fighting Tim Bowich? I think this one interests me because obviously everyone knows that Tyron Woodley has amazing takedown defense because he's a wrestler. Um, however, Maya's game has not really been like muscling guys into takedowns too much. I, I, obviously, he hits the single leg a lot, but there's a you know there's a versatility to him. Even, he's the most versatile one-dimensional fighter in the world. That's what I like to call him because yes, he will only grapple, but equally. If he can't get you down with a single leg, he'll dive under you and start pulling guard or looking to reap the leg. Um, or he'll try and dive under you and when you sit back, he'll come up on the single leg again. Uh, he'll put you to the cage and he'll try and take you back when you're defending the takedowns. Uh, he'll take you down when you're trying to defend the back. He'll try and take you back and then he'll trip you. And then as you're recovering your balance, he'll jump on your back again. You know, he's a guy who within that one area is so versatile, but doesn't really strike at all. Um, which is why a lot of fans don't like him, but also why a lot of fans love him. Meanwhile, Tyron Woodley, you know, I I have a love-hate relationship with Tyron Woodley because I do love watching him knock people out, but equally, I can't think of an entertaining fight he's been in where he didn't knock the guy out. So, you know, he has this style where he does wait a lot uh, and then he'll throw, like, two wing and right hands and run forward and he does a lot of standing on the fence and he stands on the fence because... When the other guy comes in, you can shoot a takedown and you shoot into the center of the cage, which is amazing because uh, obviously half of these guys defend takedowns by getting up along the fence. I used to call, I, in fact, I still do call it the Dagestani backstep because Hustam Kabalov or Hustam Habalov, Rustam Kabalov, whoever, and Ali Bagautinov also did it a lot. Uh, Demetrius Johnson against ba Ali Bagautinov had him on the fence the entire time, doesn't really like working on the fence, so what would happen was he'd run in, get turned onto the fence, and then start looking for the double collar tie. A uh, really weird fight in that sense. After every Maya fight, we talk about the time that he pulled guard and then got, came up on the single, and it's just genius. Uh, what he does is, uh, well, uh, Eddie Bravo calls it the dog fight, Lucas Leitch calls it the coyote. Uh, it's basically... When you come into half guard, if you can get their butt off their heels and place your outside leg in behind it and over and, and start coming up so that it's trapped, um, that's the dogfight. Uh, and that is an Eddie Bravo thing, but also like a, a Gordo thing. Um, it's just a really powerful sweeping position because you come up on a takedown while you're sitting on one of their legs. And if they stop the takedown, you roll them back the other way or dive under them. Uh, or you can come up on the single and they'll stand up and then you take them down again. I mean, Maya's been doing that for years. He'll, he'll dive underneath a guy with the single leg and then come up and take him down with it. Uh, Lucas Lage also does a thing where he'll come up on the single leg and then jump to take the back on the opposite side. Uh, did that in ADCC like a few years ago. Does it quite a lot. Uh, if you don't if you don't follow grappling that much, Lucas Lage is a really fun guy to watch because he can sweep guys so much bigger than him um, with this sort of style. And also he... Uh, his style translates very well to nogi. I mean, I struggle w watching guys who have styles that I don't think would translate or, or that I can watch not translate into nogi. Um, but his style really sort of stays the same between the two, which is quite nice. 
Actually, I was thinking of him earlier when we were talking about Leo Vieira, um, because I was watching him versus Keenan Cornelius, uh, and and uh, his passing in that is almost identical to Leo Vieira. He'll pin one knee to the mat, walk around, and then try and leg drag or weave the other leg when uh, Keenan brings it in to defend. Uh, Cornelius wins that match with an awesome uh, half guard Kimura turned into an armbar. Um, actually, Keenan Cornelius is a guy whose game is completely different from Gi to Nogi, but I love both his games, so you know he's a, an interesting one. It it just seems like that's got to be like twice as much work, <laughs> you know, developing a gi based game and then a no gi based game. Whereas guys like Marcelo Garcia talk about trying to keep it all roughly the same and not rely on their grips too much. But he keeps excelling, so you know, let him do what he wants. And I, I expect if you're training several times a day, uh, you probably get bored of one or the other and uh, and need some variety. Anyway, that um, dogfight sweep is so cool and it's working so well. Lots of jiu-jitsu guys doing it now. If you saw Rafael Lovato uh, in Bellator, uh, he just he pulls to that guard position, comes up on the single leg and sweeps his man. Um, really powerful position. You'd have to think that Woodley has the edge because he is such a threat on the feet and because he's going to be trying to stop the takedown the whole time. You know, he only he knows he only has one thing to deal with with Maya. The genius of Maya is that he can make you forget all about it, or rather, you know, you'll be thinking about it, and it, then you'll end up doing something that puts you in a position for him to go back to the first thing. You know, um, when he drops for the guard, guys sit in on top of him and suddenly forget that he's underneath them, which is what they didn't want when he was going for the single. You know, suddenly he's on their hips. Um, so it'd be very interesting because it could go the way that Andre Galvao versus Tyron Woodley went, where Andre Galvao just shot uselessly for three minutes or whatever and then got knocked out. Um, or because Woodley does stand on the fence already, Maya could just push him to the fence and then keep trying to take his back, which is a Maya staple and really not uh, too similar to the standard wrestling that you would be dealing with out in the open. Um, you know, the whole cage wrestling thing, we were talking about Bobby Whitaker earlier, the whole cage wrestling thing. Everyone's dealing with that at the same time. You know, guys coming up in, in college learning to wrestle and guys learning jiu-jitsu down in Brazil, none of them working on the fence or on the walls, um, you know, every day. And then suddenly when you're in MMA, that's a massive part of the game. Uh, your Romero uh, and Jacare couldn't deal with Bobby Whittaker just because he was so good using the fence. Anyway, that should be a cracking fight. Uh, well, actually, no, it's got every potential to stink, but <laughs> I really want to see Maya win, to be honest, just because... He's done so much, uh, and he's, you know, there's something really endearing about the way he's like, nope, I'm good at this, I'm going to focus on this, you know, uh, having been the guy who was like, no, I'm learning to strike with Vandalay Silva, and then gets knocked out by Nate Marquard. Um, so that'll be fun. Hopefully more fun than uh, the Wonder Boy versus Woodley fight. Um but whoever wins is probably getting GSP. Then you got uh, Cyborg versus Tonya Evinger. This is a fun one because Tonya Evinger is scrappy as hell. And also, you know, I said it last week, but anytime Cyborg is booked against uh, an, an established 135er like Leslie Smith or someone like that, uh, everyone goes, oh my god, she's going to eat her alive. And to be fair, any established 135er she meets is already better than most of the people she's fought. You know, she really mainly fights... 135ers who weren't that great and asked to be, you know, and were asked to bulk up to fight her. Um, so, you know, it could be fun. And Avenger is, is such a scrappy spoiler that it has all the potential to be the upset. Lawler versus Cerrone is finally happening, which we've been waiting for for ages. Um, Lawler's one I'm quite concerned about, actually, because he, he's really started to show the miles lately. Um, or seemed to at least. Uh, you know, he looked so good against Johnny Hendricks in those two fights, and then uh, he lost his title quite quickly to Woodley, and then he's just sort of been bouncing around and not really been ready to fight or getting injured and all sorts of other things happening. I'm, I'm a little worried that maybe he isn't as healthy as one would expect a, a top-flight professional fighter to be. But, you know, that's the nature of the game, so we'll get to see what he's like against Cerrone. Obviously, Lawler really likes to punch, Cerrone uh, really doesn't like to punch. He really likes to use everything but punches. Actually, butt punch is very effective if the guy's going to that Bobby Whittaker turtle along the fence. Um, but uh, you'd think Cerrone would want to use long kicks and things like that. Um, Johnny Hendricks really troubled Robbie Lawler in their first fight with low kicks just by throwing combinations because Lawler loves to move his head. And when you do that, you put the weight, you know, you're moving the weight between your feet, can't pick your leg up. 
For Lawler, you'd think you'd probably want to see him crowd Cerrone. Um, he is probably the better wrestler of the two. Um, and he's obviously the bigger hitter with his hands. And Cerrone, his problem has always been guys getting inside of his long, gangly reach. You know, uh, his his hands have looked a lot heavier at welterweight. Um, those, like, f- slapping left hooks and uppercuts that he throws just to set up the high kick. Uh, you know, he was knocking Kote down with those. Um, but you would think that Lawler has the advantage in the kitchen. You would think that's where he wants to get it. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see him coming in behind the high knee, like I was suggesting for Daniel Cormier. Got to be careful of the knee, to the, the counter knee to the body, which is a, has been a real game changer for Donald Cerrone. And bringing the knee up as you step in is one way to deal with that, or at least obstruct it a little bit. Um, then you got Jimmy Manoa. Why do you think I'm here? Uh, versus Vulcan Uzdemir. Vulcan Uzdemir, I really don't know enough about because I was like ready to sit down and, and get to know this guy's game when he fought, um, was it Serkinov? And then that fight went like 10 seconds and ended with a weird glancing blow. Um, so I'm looking forward to this one. Jimmy Manoa, I love his left hook to the body and he doesn't really throw it as much as he used to. Uh, he's really developed a right hand very nicely. His left hook's always been money. Um, might be nice to see him use more low kicks, but I would really love to see him go back to the body uh, because that is it's such a reliable way to break guys down. You know, you can hit as hard as you want, but there are going to be guys who can take it to the to the head. Um, but everyone in the world has a limit on what they can take to the body before they basically quit or their body quits on them. Then you've got Reen and Barrio, uh, head and brow versus uh, Aljamain Sterling. Hayden Barrow has fallen off hard. I thought that fight with Jeremy Stevens was very evenly matched. Very much enjoyed that. I thought they both showed interesting things. You know, that was one of Jeremy Stevens' better performances. They were, they were seeming to have, like, Jeremy Stevens' day on our MMA. They were just posting all his knockouts. And I was like, slow it down a bit. He's only got six in 25 fights with the UFC. You know, as a knockout artist, he is spectacular, but uh, really infrequent with his work. <laughs> It's really hard for them to sell him as this amazing knockout artist when he so struggled to catch guys. Um, but uh, anyway, we're talking about Barrow. Hard drop off, really suffered with the loss of the IV, um, went up to featherweight, and then he really gave up on that, didn't he? He's come back down for bantamweight for this fight. Uh, I don't know if I like that decision. But I guess we'll find out. Provided he doesn't knock himself out on a bathtub, he should be okay. And then Aljamain Sterling is one of the most interesting talents out there, but his hands, like he's working with Ray Longo, who has made Chris Weidman into a very uh, solid and respectable boxer. And yet Aljo seems really flappy and loose, like a, like a young Overeem when he threw his hands like, Ugh. oh, you can't see me flailing like a girl, but uh, well, not a girl, because obviously there are girls that can hit, but you can't see me flailing like a madman, but I was doing it then. Um, so some interesting fights on that card at any rate. And then we've got Ryzen going on as well. Not a lot of interesting fights on that. You've got Koji versus uh, Hideo Tokoro, which should be Koji Horiguchi putting the old man out to pasta. But, pasta rather. Um, but if there's one thing that Koji can't do reliably, it's finish people. You know, he's one of the hardest hitters at that weight. He regularly catches guys, but he really struggles to um, keep the pressure on guys and finish them. You know, I think it's partly that uh, in and out style. You know, he'll score a lovely connection and then he'll let the guy go, bounce back out a distance and circle round. It'd be nice to see him stay on a guy and, and really put the beating on this old man. Um, not really much else going on on that card except for uh, Kizem and Saiga versus Tenshin Nasakawa. Uh, what you got there is a really interesting kickboxer who came to MMA and has been doing all right. Had that amazing fight with Urs and Yamamoto uh, in the form, you know, uh, that's Saiga. Uh, and then you've got a really, really accomplished kickboxer coming over to MMA in Tenshin Nasakawa, uh, who maybe isn't as rounded in the MMA game yet. So if you made that an MMA fight, that'd be awesome. If you made it a kickboxing fight, it'd be fun. If you make it a mixed rules fight like they have, it's just pointless. Why? Can't stand uh, mixed rules fights. But it just means that it doesn't end up on either of their official records. I really hope they don't have to change the gloves between rounds too. That's just such a pain in the ass. Anyway, not uh, a tremendous amount to talk about this week. I did prattle on about my own uh, stuff a bit this week, but um, hopefully we'll have lots to talk about next week. Like I said, got a big project in the works already. Uh, That's probably going to be a few weeks until payoff, so uh, just remember that I said this when you don't see me for a while, or if you don't see me for a while. Um, I'll keep doing the podcast, obviously, and uh, the history episodes due up, I believe, next weekend. If you haven't signed up for the Patreon, make sure to. Uh, if you haven't bought Notorious yet and you're American, do it. 
uh, because it has Conor McGregor's secret game plan for Floyd Mayweather in it. Uh, MMA angles, that's all I'm saying. And I uh, uh, hope you have an all right week. Thanks for listening to me moan. Cheers. <laughs>